It's an odd paradox. Get it right in the media and you could go unnoticed. Blow it, and depending on how badly you mess up, you could end up in the eye of a media storm. Worse still, your reputation could be irrevocably damaged. Reputation is a subtle and ill-defined thing that plays an incredibly important role in business. Buying, selling, promoting, and firing decisions all contain a portion of reputation in them. How do you form a reputation? And for a company, it's not that much more di difficult than looking at it as a person. I have a reputation. I've built that reputation by the, by the way I act and behave, the things I do and I say, v through various different ways that I do that. It might be at a cocktail party, it might be at work, whatever those things are. It's the same way for a company. I build, the company builds its reputation by what it does and how it acts and how various people get that impression of the reputation, whether it's their employees and how they feel or how their employees talk about them or whether they read about them in the news media. So it's a full matrix of those things. In essence, all you have is your brand. The way you handle yourself in the media plays a powerful role in determining your reputation, which is what you do, what you say, and what others say about you. So getting it wrong affects you, the organization you represent, and the bottom line. Take a look at Michael Phelps, an Olympian hero, and in seconds, all his medals, all his, the hero stature that he had, has been blemished by one foolish moment. Michael Phelps was using a bong at a party. Someone took his picture, and in a puff of smoke, there goes millions of dollars. He apologized to everyone immediately, and still he was suspended from competition, and Kellogg's dropped him. At superstar status, everything you do is watched and recorded. And even when you are doing everything right, the pressure is intense to keep getting it right. Canadian Katrina LeMay Doan competed in four Olympics in speed skating. She won gold twice and for a number of years was the fastest woman on ice in the world. And while speed skating isn't on everyone's radar, because she was so good, she became a household name in Canada and in particular in the Netherlands where speed skating is akin to hockey in Canada or football in the United States. After you have success, it's overwhelming not only on the media side, but the people being aware of who you are and in a way you don't have an escape. My escape, I remember one day was sitting in my car and crying because that was my safe zone. I couldn't go anywhere without somebody seeing me and recognizing me and that was my safe zone. So the media is a blessing because you want to get the awareness, you want to have your sport out there, you want to have your name out there, but you, ha you have to learn how to control it. And I had a great relationship with the media. I was very open with them. They understood when it wasn't the right time, but uh, it is an adjustment. These days with cell phone cameras and social media like Twitter, everyone is a journalist. If the media is focusing on you, you need to start to pay attention to everything you do. The way you treat the waiter, the parking lot attendant, or the president of France. It all matters equally. Even when you are doing a great job of managing your reputation, there is another pitfall to be wary of. The occasional reporter that twists your words to garner a headline. Simon Fraser University's Dr. Stephen Hart is a forensic psychologist and psychology of law professor. He has literally been interviewed hundreds of times. He knows what he's doing, and yet he's still being burned. Hart recalls one occasion wherein he spent hours doing an interview with a print reporter. I spent um, hours and hours, probably somewhere between about 8 and 12 hours, talking to her, setting her up with people in the field so she could talk to them. And then uh, we were having lunch one day and she asked me a couple of questions and I mean, this is lunch out, outside of work. And so it was my impression that everything that we were talking about was informal and off the record. And she took a couple of offhand comments that I made and they became headlines. And I actually felt really burned. I felt completely manipulated. I spent hours and hours giving quotes, being interviewed and trying to speak in reasonable manners. And I felt like a few things that I'd said that were off the cuff, um, off the record remarks were 
turned into something that was solely designed to sell newspapers. That bad experience I had with the print media person, one of the things I learned was, you know, I actually have to protect myself. It's not the person who's interviewing me. It's not their job to protect me or to keep my reputation intact. There's another kind of mistake that can easily be made when dealing with the media. Lack of appropriate preparation. And no matter how accomplished you may be within your own profession, that does not translate into being accomplished when it comes to the media. Judge Carol Baird Ellen was the chief judge of the Provincial Court of British Columbia for five years. She assumed that role at a time when the media was intensely focused on the government-ordered closing of several courthouses. She was not prepared for the media onslaught. It became um, a phobia almost because once you've had that really bad experience where they take the sound bite and it sounds like you've said really the opposite of what you said, even in, um, in print, I found that experience. I, I do a quick interview on the phone and they take, you know, the last part of one sentence and that would be the headline and you'd be horrified. So I became almost phobic. However, Baird Ellen was a quick study. She engaged a media trainer and developed the skill set she needed to negotiate media requests successfully. When it came on later in my term that there was a, a specific attack on um, lenient sentencing and the way the court does its daily business, we were better equipped with the help of a professional to go th out um, and invite the media to interview us and be prepared for that interview. And then there are normal citizens who come upon situations that need to be addressed. They do the right thing and speak up about those issues. But without any media training, their key messages can quickly become obscured and the story can be hijacked by media looking to simply sensationalize a topic for easy ratings. Trina Campbell was shopping with her daughter at an apparel store when she noticed a pornographic magazine featured in a shopping display. When it became obvious to her that this was a purposeful head office decision, she decided to respond to a radio invitation to viewers to call in if they had an issue. Trina called in and the radio station jumped on the story. Radio and television interviews happened right away and other media outlets were soon in hot pursuit. The whole thing wasn't about American apparel, it was just about pornography in my local clothing store where my children shop. But it turned into, uh, you know, my lifestyle and everything about me. My reasons for doing it were completely lost at that point. There's yet another way of getting it wrong. This isn't through a kind of innocence about what the media is capable of. It's through a premeditated decision to be evasive, to mislead, or to out and out lie. A reporter's stock and trade is factual information. If you lie to a reporter and they present that lie as fact, they are hugely compromised and there will be repercussions for you. If you tread into this territory, you are playing with fire and eventually you will definitely get burned. Don't do it. There is one thing that I absolutely hate more than anything else and that is just someone who will lie to me. I give you the benefit of the doubt, don't lie to me. If you lie to me then, and I find out, then it changes the entire relationship. If you need to have time, ask the reporter for time. A good story will hold. They want a business-like uh, approach. They want efficiency. They want absolute honesty. If, if, uh, if you tell a lie, you're going to get caught, and that's going to haunt you for the rest of your career. The mistake of lying is something that can be absolutely avoided. And by doing some media training, you can identify and practice key messaging. Or you can hire a public relations firm. Many of these other getting it wrong issues can be avoided altogether thanks to their help. There are enough people out there who will continue to get it wrong to the point that one PR agency has launched the PR Blunder Blog, showcasing the most disastrous of the day and coupling these with experts suggesting what the blunderers can do to get themselves out of their jam. Well, we're doing it because of a couple things. One is that I think people are fascinated with kind of the, 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 the traffic accidents of, of, of public relations. You know, we're, we all kind of tune in 
to see the latest thing that some celebrity or politician has done wrong and we shake our heads and go, oh my God, how could they have done that? So people gravitate to that. What that gives us an opportunity to do is to help people then understand how to avoid that. And that's good for everybody. It is a big responsibility getting involved in the in media stuff because you can say things, especially for me, I'm usually commenting about stories that are um, before the courts or going to come before the courts eventually. And I can screw up that process. If I said the wrong thing, I could actually make it impossible for somebody to have a fair trial. PR blunders aside, most people are trying their hardest to get it right. That goes for both the reporter doing the interviews and for the people being interviewed. Most media people are conscientious and ethical. They want to represent you fairly. Equally, most people being interviewed also want to get it right because in many cases, the ramifications of getting it wrong for both sides are formidable.